I thought I would give you a little bit of background on some current controversy in genetics slash genomics research. Um, you'll see some aspects of it are related to behavioral genomics or social science um, genomic research, but it's not exclusively related to that. Nevertheless, I think for any of you who haven't had a lot of experience with genomic research and are like looking to go into it, um, this is important background to have. And similarly, I'll, I'll talk just a little bit about the recent revisions to the common rule. The common rule is the set of federal regulations in the U.S. that govern most human subjects research. And some of you may have heard inklings of a many years long process in which uh, regulators really sought to overhaul it. So I'll talk a little bit about what in the, in the end, after about seven years, finally happened and, and what we can look forward to next year when it goes into effect. Then I want to talk more specifically about, you know, the concerns that people have about what I'm going to call, for simplicity's sake, behavioral genomics research. Um, then I'm going to move to, you know, given those worries, what are the reasons, the sort of affirmative reasons for doing some of the work that all of you have come here to learn about? And finally, from whether to how. Um, having addressed some of the concerns and some of the reasons, you know, spoiler alert, I'm not going to conclude that, you know, this research should never be done. That would be a very strange talk to, to have on what is this day two of camp. Day one. Oh, day one, even stranger. Um, so having sort of done some brush clearing uh, and decided that, you know, it should proceed, some of it should, should proceed, there are still questions about, well, how, and what, you know, what does the responsible conduct of behavioral genomic research entail? So that's the overview of, um, of that. Feel free to interrupt me with questions for clarification, et cetera. Um, I think at, there will also be time at the end. We'll you know, conclude the formal lecture, and the camera will go away. And because some of this is sensitive, and, and the internet is forever, so um, it's my job to say controversial things on tape. But it's not your job, so at some point we'll, we'll turn that off and if you want to just I'll hang around and if you want to have a more informal conversation about some of this stuff um, sort of off the record, I'm, I'm very happy to do that. Okay, so here's some of the background. Um, I mentioned the common rule. There, uh, as I'll mention in a, in, a, in a few slides, there was a, a huge proposal to, to really radically change the way that um, we govern research with biospecimens. Obviously, much of that research is, is genomic and genetic. And most of that has been anim animated by three cases and then a general concern. So here's the first case. First case is the Havasupai tribe. So this is a, a Native American tribe um, that is situated in a very isolated part of the Grand Canyon. Um, members are about 650. And as of 1991, there was a, a very high incidence of type 2 diabetes in the tribe. For women, it was about 55% of the tribe. For men, about 38%. And the tribe actually approached researchers at Arizona State University um, to, to see, you know, maybe there's what's going on here. How can you, um, you know, can you help us figure out whether something is going on? And the researchers came and they took blood samples from about 400 members of the tribe. Now, all of this is alleged uh, and, and the details are still disputed. So what I'm going to give you is, is sort of the conventional wisdom and I certainly don't know, I wasn't there, I certainly don't know what actually happened. What I'm giving you are allegations that are generally received as, as true. So. It, there was something of an oral agreement, if you will, that the purpose of taking these blood samples was to study diabetes and to sort of do something that would hopefully directly benefit the tribe. There was, as, as is typical, an actual written consent form. The written consent did not say diabetes. It certainly didn't limit the scope of the use of the specimens to diabetes. Instead, it said that the study um, that the, the purpose of the samples will be to study causes of behavioral slash medical disorders. As you can probably see, that's rather broad. Now here's the allegation. The allegation is that both the primary researchers and down the line various grad students and uh, secondary researchers who, um, who received some of the samples as part of sample sharing studied, among other things, schizophrenia, consanguinity, 
and population migration uh, in this tribe specifically. I assume you can imagine um, you know, why schizophrenia and consanguinity are sort of sensitive traits to study. The reason why population migration is sensitive for this particular tribe is they have a, an origins story that, that has them originating, in fact, in this isolated part of the Grand Canyon. Not migrating out of Africa with, with other people, but their populations, but actually originally, you know, um, rising up in, in the Grand Canyon and um, as part of a, the original protector of the Grand Canyon, in fact. So scientific data that suggested otherwise was, was definitely problematic for the tribe. So therein followed a lawsuit, too, if you want to be technical about it. Um, the long and the short of it is ASU spent $1.7 million litigating the case. It eventually settled, as most of these things do. It settled for about $700,000. And part of the settlement required researchers and the university to return the remaining 151 samples that they still had. Some publications were redacted. Uh, and this is a classic case of group harm. This is what's called group harm in the literature. And what I mean by that is the stigma um, that comes from a conclusion that says, this population of people has a high incidence of schizophrenia or consanguinity, et cetera. That stigma is not, does not only attach to people who participated in the study, that is to those 400 people whose blood was taken, right? Because in as much as the, the scientific claim is that members of this tribe overall have a higher incidence, the inferences you can make are not just about those 400 people, but about all 650 members of the tribe. So this is one important um, concern that people have about social science genetics. Okay, case two, um, newborn blood spots. So as, as most of you know, this is a Guthrie heel prick. Um, all states require this for very good public health reasons. Uh, it can detect PKU, many other um, diseases that if not treated very quickly could have fairly catastrophic consequences, but if treated, um, do not, such as PKU. In many states, uh, the residual dried blood spots on this card are stored and can be used for a very wide range of secondary research um, without parental consent or even knowledge. So this has been going on a long time, and at some point uh, in a couple of different states, people got wind of it and, and were not happy. So here's one example uh, of the type of research that was that was done. So in Texas, about 800 of these samples, all of them non-identified, were sent to the U.S. Armed Forces Lab um, to help determine population level variation in DNA among different ethnic groups. Critics who discovered this viewed this as a government database for eugenics and for the purpose of healthcare rationing. That was what they believed the real purpose of this was probably exacerbated by the fact that, again, no one had gotten their permission, no one had told them that this was happening. Um, it's never a great framing for interpreting people's motives when you don't know something has happened and then you sort of discover it, you read it in a newspaper or whatever. It's never a great um, way to approach something. So this was the reaction from some people. And once again, we had a pair of lawsuits, uh, one in Minnesota and one in Texas. The Minnesota, again, settled. Uh, part of the settlement required the state to return all of the cards and just return and or destroy them. So this huge, you know, um, resource was destroyed. And same thing with in Texas, uh, another, little, another lawsuit, uh, the state had to destroy five million of these samples. The final sort of fallout from this uh, is that the, really the lobbying, it was, it was truly lobbying, um, got past the Federal Newborn Screening Saves Lives Reauthorization Act of 2014. And basically, um, as I'll mention soon, under the current common rule, a biospecimen that, is, that exists for some other reason. So in this case, there's a clinical public health purpose. It was taken for public health purposes and stored. Stripped of identifiers, so it's not identified. That type of biospecimen currently can be used without consent um, or, or notification even of the proban, the person from whose body it comes. And the reason why is because the common rule does not consider that to be human subjects. 
you can be conducting research on it, but your research doesn't involve human subjects if the data is not identifiable and if you have not had to intervene or interact with anyone to get it. I'll go over that again, so, so don't worry. But um, what this act of 2014 did was by fiat say this very particular case of such biospecimens research is hereafter human subjects research. All other biospecimens research that meets the description I just offered is not, but this pocket we're carving out and we're gonna say this is human subjects research. And as a result, of course, it's subject to the common rule, it's subject to IRB review, it's generally subject to consent and so forth and so on. And what they did was say, okay, that's gonna be the rule until such time as we figure out what's going on with the new common rule because the new common rule proposed that this whole, that we would have that kind of regime for all biospecimens research. Um, I'll, I'll come back to what happened to that in a minute. Okay, third and final case, who's heard of Henrietta Lacks and this book? Okay, a fair amount of you, at least half of you, right. So this is a New York Times best-selling book by Rebecca Skloot. Um, it, it's a, a, a fascinating history of the HeLa cell line. So Henrietta Lacks was an African-American woman who unfortunately had cervical cancer. She was treated at Johns Hopkins. Um, there's no indication that she received subpar treatment. Um, she was Hopkins, she probably received some of the best treatment that was available. Unfortunately, her cancer was uh, advanced and she did die. But while her, uh, her healthcare provider was, was caring for her, he scraped some, some of her cervical cells and he gave them to his research colleague down the hall who had been trying for some time to create uh, an immortal line, that is a, a cell line that would replicate um, constantly that could be used for research. And he had failed and failed and failed. And this had become this doctor's routine was to take cells that he was already taking for clinical purposes and instead of throwing them away in the biohazard bin, sending them down the hall to his friend, the researcher, to see what he could make of it. And for reasons that aren't 100% clear, um, hers was the big winner. So Henrietta Lacks's cells became the first immortal cell line. The going theory, which is probably right, is that, of course, a lot of cervical cancer is caused by HPV, the human papillomavirus. Probably that was the case here, and so the, the viral aspect of those cells probably is um, combined with cancer, probably what made them um, immortal. Probably nothing having to do with Henrietta Lacks herself. Nothing about her own genome was particularly uh, unique like, like the rest of us. So these were taken uh, as was custom at the time and remains the case today. These were taken without her knowledge or consent, right? So pretty much every person in this room has had some sort of tissue taken. You've gone, you've had a, drug, a, a blood draw, whether for a diagnostic purpose, um, maybe there's a little blood left over. They strip that of identifiers. You know, it's not attached to your medical record, your name, your social, et cetera. And it's sent off to some biobank. So most of us have little bits of ourselves in biobanks around the world. Um, and, and none of us in general were asked permission, we weren't given notice even, et cetera. So this was not unusual then or today. However, what became of her cells was unusual. Um, they have, you know, read the book if you, I mean truly, read, read the book if you wanna know um, all the different things that the HeLa cells have contributed to. Um, they've, they've been profoundly life-saving for, for all of us as well. For example, they're behind this, the Salk vaccine for polio. Um, so that alone, you know, is, is amazing. The controversy though, um, and there's, there's several different um, pieces of the controversy and it's sometimes hard to kind of tease out which pieces of it people are, are reacting to. Um, so the first thing is, and the most basic thing is, you know, her, her tissue was taken without her knowledge or consent, right? So that's number one. The second thing is privacy issues. 
So today, you know, this was well before HIPAA, let's, let's just say, today you would never label her cell line the way it was, but back then, at least in that, in that hospital, the custom was to label cells with the first two letters of the first name followed by the first two letters of the last name. So Henrietta Lacks gets you HeLa, the HeLa cell line. That's where that comes from. And it's not that once you figure out this is an amazing cell line, I'm interested in figuring out the history behind it. It's not that difficult to figure out who the patient was and to trace that back. Um, and so in short order, she, she had you know, passed on by that point, but her descendants were there. And so a bunch of different things happened. One thing is that the research, or some researchers identified the descendants and in an effort to try to figure out was there something unusual about Henrietta Lacks's cells, actually procured tissue from the relatives at, at best without fully explaining why and what was going on. Because they had no idea either that their mother had, uh, that her cells had, had been involved in all this at the time. Um, so at, at very best, there was a profound gap of communication. At worst, uh, they, they procured these tissue samples under truly false <coughs> pretenses. Um, that's not, that's truly not kosher. Uh, you know, as a research ethicist, I can tell you that's, you know, you don't sort of, um, you know, approach someone and, and, and procure samples under, under sort of false pretenses. That's, that's kind of a no-no. But that's not, that's the least well-known of all of these things. That's not actually what most people have in mind when they think about, about Henrietta Lacks. Um, the last thing, well, one more issue with, with privacy. So as researchers began to study the HeLa cell line itself, they began to sequence the HeLa cell line. Uh, it turns out you can infer things about the descendants from the HeLa cell line. That became a major privacy issue. There were a couple of publications that had to be sort of halted. NIH ended up creating a special committee that has members of um, the descendants, members of the family represented on it to try to sort of vet what research can be done. That's also an extraordinarily unusual situation where you have a cell line where, um, in part thanks to Rebecca Sklute, uh, they're truly a household name. And so it's now a, a major privacy issue. And for those of you who missed it, recently um, Oprah um, played the daughter of, of Henrietta Lacks and Rose Byrne played Rebecca Sklute. So this was a, an HBO, made for HBO movie um, that came out in April. So to add more, more publicity. The last thing is that, you know, the researcher who actually created the immortal cell line himself made, made no money from it. He freely gave it away. He was a good open science guy before his time. Um, so he was just giving it away, but other people did commercialize it in different forms. And so a lot of money has been, has been made from it. And of course, Henrietta Lacks didn't get a dime and neither did any of her descendants. So that's a whole other strand of this. Uh, some people say, you know, this is sort of biopiracy, where some people have sort of taken this resource that's turned out to be, in, you know, incredibly valuable um, without compensating them in any way, and to sort of um, add insult to injury, most of the de of her descendants remain relatively poor uh, compared to the, the general population, and in particular have sketchy at best access to health care. Okay. So those are the three kind of cases that have all had a very explicit and direct impact um, on, on a lot of debates on, on how biobanks are, are now governed and set up and also in the evolving common role. Here is the general concern. And the general concern is that, you know, we used to think if we de-identified something, de-identification is, is a HIPAA word. Um, but if we use something like HIPAA tools to de-identify data, then it was anonymous and we could basically guarantee research participants, patients, et cetera, that their privacy was no longer an issue. That has, has turned out to be not so much the case. Um, so one of the most famous and, and earliest examples of that uh, before he was the vice presidential candidate, uh, he was Governor Bill Weld of Massachusetts. And in the mid 90s, um, the Massachusetts Group Insurance Commission released data on um, individual hospital visits 
uh, experienced by uh, state employees. And they released it to, to aid, it was, a big, it was a big research database to help understand um, why health costs were so high, help you know, increase quality, decrease costs, et cetera. And Governor Weld you know, got on TV and, and assured employees, don't worry, your data has been anonymized. Uh, it says you know, all your identifiers, which at the time meant you know, name, address, and social security number, they've all been removed, so not to worry. Um, in 1996, he collapsed. He sort of had a Hillary moment. Um, he collapsed at an event, but instead of uh, going to Chelsea's house, he uh, was admitted to the hospital briefly, and thus triggering a, a hospital admission record. So Latanya Sweeney, who's pictured here, who was at the time um, a, a obviously very brilliant uh, MIT grad student, was convinced that this was nonsense. This idea that, that all of this data was truly anonymized was just nonsense, and she set out to prove as much. Um, so at the time, most states, when they collected hospital discharge data, it, it's true that they contained no direct identifiers, uh, names, addresses, social security numbers, but they did contain quasi-identifiers, that is, full zip code, uh, full date of birth, not just year, and sex. And it turns out that the Cambridge voter registration rolls also contain those three data points. And for $20, Latanya Sweeney got her one. Um, and with a really pretty simple kind of matching technique, she was able to uh, re-identify Bill Weld's admission. And in a dramatic flourish, she sent it, had it sent to his, um, to his office. Okay. So... Uh, and, and this was, you know, allowed her to see all of the diagnoses and prescriptions that were associated with, with that visit. So this had a really profound impact on HIPAA. So HIPAA's, um, you know, HIPAA's privacy rule uh, was, was developed in large part because of Latanya Sweeney's work. And uh, she, when she published her paper about this, she estimated, just an estimate, so she estimated that 87% of the U.S. population were, uh, are re-identifiable solely on the basis of full zip, full date of birth, and sex. Now, I've given you, um, I've given you the, the paper citation down there. I'll make the slides available. You can, you can look at it later if you want. The second citation is from Daniel Barth Jones, who's a statistical epidemiologist at the uh, Columbia School of Public Health who's done some important work contextualizing this. And among other things, he points out that um, her estimate was pre-HIPAA. Sort of the irony, she's a little bit of a victim of her own success in that her early demonstration prompted HIPAA. Post-HIPAA, um, you know, we don't usually use full zip, full date of birth, sex as well. Um, it was also an estimation, and we'll see We'll see in a minute um, that the estimate was a little bit, uh, a little bit high. So Sweeney um, replicated, if you will, her Bill Weld experiment in 2013 using um, an online database. It's called the Personal Genome Project. Um, George Church is a Harvard geneticist. It's his project. Uh, it's been around for a while, and. It's sort of a proof of principle um, that it's really radical, radical openness is what it is. So it's fully sequenced genomes with as much phenotype data as participants want to give. And so the first 10 all had, the, they all have their names there. Um, so George Church is PGP1 um, and, and, you know, you name all the, the PGP10 and they have their, their photos and their names and their hospital records and um, you'll know more about George Church than you ever wanted to know if you look at his, his, PGP, um, his PGP profile. Um, at the time, Harvard's IRB said, okay, to participate in that, you have to have the equivalent of a master's degree in genetics. You can kind of see why. Um, they, they relaxed a little bit over time and, and said, okay, instead you just need to pass a comprehension quiz at a rate of 100%. Uh, and so there are many, many more people than 10 in the project now, and there's a range of what they, what they provide. So Latanya Sweeney, uh, you know, replicated her, her re-identification attack using this database, um, the exact same, the exact same one. 
and it was um, reported in Forbes and many other places. Uh, and she, you know, she re-identified more than 40%. Now, it's important to know that some portion of that, and I forget the exact numbers, again, Daniel Bart Jones um, has all the details on this, but some portion of that 40% was actually people who uploaded their 23andMe data, um, which is something you can do into your PGP thing. And the file number would have their name in it. It'd be like, you know, Michelle Myers 23andMe data, and you'd upload that. So that's not maybe so impressive um, that she was able to re-identify, you know, data that, that the metadata really like had it in, in there, right? Um, I mean, the other thing to note is that most people in the PGP, um, first of all, everyone is warned that there is no such thing as guaranteed anonymity. Um, and many people put their names on and, and use their full zip code um, for research purposes to have the data be more useful and fully knowing the risk. In any case, uh, so it turns out that I am myself a participant in the PGP. Um, and I learned about this on Twitter, as one does. Um, and Twitter took, took me to this Forbes article. And as you can see, it said, you know, um, you know, from the outset, the PGP participants were warned, you know, of the risk that someone someday could identify them. That day arrived on Thursday. Gong, gong, gong. Um, <laughs> You know, and I had about uh, like an hour or so where I was truly sort of panicked. I was like, wait, what? What just happened? Um, and it wasn't so much my, my genomic information as my phenotypic uh, typic information that I had put, health records, that kind of stuff, trying to be helpful um, to the researchers, trying to give lots of data. Uh, and it turns out she did not successfully re-identify me because I did not provide my full zip code, I did not provide my full date of birth, and so forth and so on, and that's what this was testing, so. Um, this is a little bit of a digression, but I did want to mention one thing, because um, it may come up in your, in your careers at some point. So, Latanya Sweeney at the time was at Harvard, I at the time was at Harvard, the Personal Genome Project is a Harvard-based project with fairly heavy participant membership that with ties to Harvard. Um, and although she and I were are not, you know, in the same discipline, um, it's fair to say that we have overlapping interests. To wit, I am here before you talking about some of her work. Um, most of us have different you know, have, have privacy interests that shift depending on the context. And one contextual feature is who is it that is learning something about me? I could not have cared less if someone on the other side of the earth learned something about one Michelle Meyer. You know, I'm never gonna meet that person, they're never gonna meet me, it doesn't matter. Wouldn't have bothered me at all. But to think that someone who, you know, was really around the corner, who was sort of in my professional circle, might have learned particular things, was, was rather different. And this is a common, it's sort of a convenient sample, right? It's not uncommon to have people study people who are kind of right um, among them. And so it's just something to, to watch out about. It, it is convenient, but it can raise the, the privacy risks a little bit. Okay, so, <coughs> By the way, so just to note, this was a re-identification of a genomics research project that had absolutely nothing to do with the genomic data, right? The re-identification had, was just about um, voter roll stuff, right? Here is an example where it really was, it really is the <laughs> genomic data that was used to re-identify. Um, so this is a fun project um, from Yaniv Ehrlich's lab and uh, he also demonstrated it on the PGP at the same time. I was quickly reassured, since I lack a Y chromosome, that I was in the clear on this one too. But here's, <laughs> here's how this works. So um, the, the, the real paper, the science paper, was not the PGP. That was a fun little, little replication. The real paper, um, the attack was on the 1,000 Genomes Project. So that is kind of like the PGP. Uh, it's an open online database of as it turns out, 2,500, not so much 1,000, but 2,500 um, unidentified sequenced genomes. And he was able, they were able to re-identify five participants. <laughs> um, and these were people who had also participated in a study of Mormon families in Utah. So here's how it works. Um, 
So first you profile the, um, the Y chromosome short tandem repeat of a particular participant. And there's many more, um, many more points than this. This is just you know, a, a snippet of it. Um, and so you, you develop a, a profile, a, a YSTR profile of a particular participant from the 1000 Genome Project. Then you go to your favorite online genetic database, um, for example, uh, what is it called? Y, y search. Um, yeah, y search. So ysearch.org, ysearch.com, something like that. Um, the, there are tools now for people who want to connect, right? And, and this is, um, I think it's Family Tree DNA. I think it's like a free tool of, of that of that sort of um, direct to consumer project. And there will be little drop down things and you, you put in, you fill out the profile, right? Like so. And then after you, very important step, you have to fill out the CAPTCHA thing and prove, you know, I am not a robot and hit search. And it'll pull up, um, you know, profiles with last names. And as you can see, Venter, so this is, uh, this is the, So this is in fact Craig Ventner's uh, YSTR profile. That's it put into this, um, this online tool. And then here you have you know, a couple of different suggestions, but Venter in fact matches all 33. All the other ones are, are down there. So your confidence level is, is, is definitely highest with, with Venter. And I am not smart enough to do this by myself. Um, the website down there, this is a, a fun little sample. They will actually take you step by step and step and step and step through all of this if you want to learn how to do it yourself. They obviously did it with Craig Ventner, whose genome is already public. Um, so that's how, that's how that worked. Okay, so the common rule. Um, common rule is, like I said, it's the set of federal regulations that, that govern most human subjects research. Uh, it applies if your research is federally funded or federally conducted. So it applies to the feds who are conducting the research. Um, it also applies, it has historically applied to research conducted at an institution that has chosen to, as we say, check the box, which means for reasons known only to them, they um, volunteer to extend the common rule protections, IRB review mostly, um, to all the research conducted at their institution. That is actually going away. That's no longer going to be an option. So the federal regulators have said, you know, we are not so much interested in <laughs> having jurisdiction over your sociology studies and whatnot. Um, we're going to limit our jurisdiction to what we fund, basically. Having said that, the other, the third way that you can come within the common rule is really because your institution just adopts it as policy. So virtually every academic institution adopts the common rule and applies it to all the research, uh, the human subjects research conducted there, regardless of whether they checked the box or not. So I don't actually expect that the, the checking the box option going away is actually going to make much of a difference. Um, so it's important to know, even if you are not fortunate enough to be given lots of NSF or NIH money, uh, it's still important to know what the common rule says. So uh, I'm just going to talk about a little tiny piece, obviously relevant to biospecimens research. So you can think about, um, you can think about research along sort of two dimensions. You can think about biospecimens versus data, and then you can think about whether it's identifiable or non-identifiable. The first thing to know is that if you are doing prospective research, if I'm going up to you and saying, Sam, could I have a buccal swab of your cheek cells because I want to study whatever, that's going to be human subjects research. You're done. Um, that's because I am deigning to interact with Sam. So there are like a few different ways you can kind of get into the common role and intervening on someone or in their environment is one, interacting with them, which normal people call talking, 
Um, but interacting with people is another way. And then obtaining identifiable data is, is the final way. So any sort of prospective, you know, I'm gonna build a biobank and I'm gonna go to you, not as a patient, I'm gonna go to you as a research subject and, and get stuff from you. That's, that's in the common rule. That's, never, that's sort of never gonna change. What we're talking about here is really secondary research. So two, two basic use cases. The first one is Henrietta Lacks. Um, so you go to your doctor, like we all do, you have some sort of tissue, it's a, it's a biopsy, it's a blood draw, whatever. It's left over, you strip it of identifiers, and you can use it in research. That's one use case. The other use case uh, is where it was originally collected for research, but now it's been shared with somebody else. Um, and you're now a secondary researcher, so there's no intervention, no interaction on your part. And the question is how to govern that. So currently, the, the current 2016 common rule applies only to that type of biospecimen or data if it's identifiable. If it's not identifiable, if you strip it of identifiers, you, you are not doing anything with human subjects and the common rule doesn't apply. However, there are all kinds of problems. So first, so you, can, you can see a lot hinges on whether something is identifiable and we just went through how some assumptions about whether something is identifiable or not identifiable are a little bit shakier than all of us sort of thought maybe 10 years ago. So federal regulators are paying attention, they're reading science, they're reading Univ Ehrlich's thing, they're reading Latanya Sweeney's work, they're not unaware of this stuff. Um, increasingly, it's, be you know, it's becoming increasingly uncomfortable to have so very much ride on this distinction between identifiable and non-identifiable. The other thing is that the definition of identifiable is incredibly weak. It's really just whether an investigator can readily ascertain the identifiability. Um, and so, for example, if I took a bunch of data and I coded it, and then I shared it with you, coded, and then I, we had a memo, like a memorandum of understanding, and I said, I will never give you this code. I don't care what you do to me until all these participants are dead, I'm never gonna give you this code. And you say, okay, and then I give you the data, you're good. No human subjects. Um, that under OHRP guidance is one way of, of ensuring that something is non-identifiable. So it does not really address all these re-identification technologies. Of course, entirely separate from whether something is identifiable or not, is this issue of autonomy interests, right? So again, this goes back to um, Habasu Pai in particular and some of the concerns about some of the uses of the newborn blood spot. Um, whether or not you are identified with particular data, the conclusions might be upsetting to you. They might be more than upsetting. They might stigmatize you. They might lead to discrimination. They might harm you in some way. They might harm member, other members of your group, whether families, members, or, or so forth and so on. Um, you also might not want to be complicit in having literally pieces of your body used in something to which you are morally, politically, religiously opposed. So there was this recognition on the one hand that you know this identifiability, non-identifiability stuff is, is kind of built on sand. And on the other hand, even if something, even if we could know that data and tissue is not identifiable, there are still arguably autonomy interests. Leaving aside privacy interests, there are these autonomy interests. Sometimes people call them dignity interests. Um, group harm is, is a different level of that, et cetera, et cetera. And so, what the NPRM, um, so that's the Notice of Proposed Rulemaking, so that's sort of the penultimate proposed revision. What they proposed to do was to extend it from that to that. In other words, they proposed to say all biospecimens research, regardless of identifiability, doesn't matter, you know, you can put someone's name on it, you can not, doesn't matter, we're gonna treat it all the same. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna make you get consent. So Henrietta Lacks wouldn't have happened anymore. You'd have to have gotten consent. However, it was a particular type of consent, broad consent. Um, you know, federal regulators are, aren't dumb and it's simply not feasible to get study specific consent for biospecimens research, right? It, it's, it's just it's a non-starter. So what they proposed was, look, when you take the samples 
get consent to store it and maintain it for future research, and then tell them something about the kinds of people who might have access to it, the kinds of things you might study with it, and the kinds of sort of security measures you're going to put in place. Broad consent. Uh, inexplicably, the proposal did nothing with data. So you, you could have had the following scenario. Um, a researcher could come to you and say, you know, um, let's, let's put it this way, I have an undiagnosed condition of some sort. My doctor says, let's do some clinical exome sequencing or whole genome sequencing. And I say, okay, and they draw the blood. And they say, you know, could we draw a second vial for bio, bio bank work? And I say, no, I don't want anything to do with that. And they say, okay. And that's the end of that. You've asked me, I've said no, that's the end. They now sequence my exome or my genome. They depose it to my electronic health record, um, as one does in 2017. It becomes part of, because after all, it was a clinical purpose. You can then de-identify my, my medical record, and you can study the sequence. You can study the data that came from the vial of blood um, without my knowledge or consent, even when you couldn't have studied the blood. And even after you asked me and I said no, so that was a little bit of a peculiar thing. And that was one of many, many problems that people had with, with this proposed rule. And in the end, it did not go forward, kind of. So this is the day that they announced this. This came on the, literally on the eve of Obama's um, last day in, in office. And um, these are various federal regulators. And they, they explained um, they said, you know, the most notable thing about the final common rule is that it does not go forward with this proposal I've just talked about, which is extremely controversial. And the reason they gave is they said commenters in every category um, expressed concern that this would significantly harm research without producing any substantial offsetting benefits. And, and they say, you know, this is actually incredibly important because really the whole purpose of proposing this was because federal regulators made some assumptions about what the public thought was, was and was not appropriate to do with biospecimens. And they say, you know, that premise now seems questionable. So where we are today is, is, or sorry, where we will be in January of 2018 when the new common rule goes into effect with respect to this issue, there are lots of other changes I'm not gonna talk about. With respect to this issue, we're ex basically exactly the same, except, 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 except. And notice that nowhere in this New England Journal commentary is this mentioned. So the final rule, that is the 2018 common rule, the final rule says, requires agencies in consultation with experts, at least within the first year and at least every, every four years thereafter, to do two things. First, to re-examine this meaning of identifiable. And if permitted by law, agencies then may choose to alter the interpretation of identifiable, including through guidance. Guidance doesn't require public notice and comment. It's not rulemaking, it's guidance. It's something completely different. And it's a little curious that after making such a big deal out of public comments and what they learned from them, they're basically now saying, you know, we can put through outside the regulatory process what we couldn't do inside of it um, without public comment and, and notice. So it could be that at some point agencies decide that, you know, there's a different meaning of identifiable and then any, that would shift everything, right? The other thing they have to do is they have to assess whether particular technologies or techniques um, should be thought of as creating per se identifiable data. And the preamble <laughs> of the final rule says specifically that whole genome sequencing is going to be first up for consideration. So what happens if we decide um, that, yeah, this technology, we should really just assume that this is going to be identifiable data that comes out of this technology? Well, then it would go on a list, and the list would have to be published in the Federal Register, and that, putting a technology in a list, that would get public notice and comment. But that's just a list. Once that happens, then the preamble says recommendations might accordingly be made to require consent. So there's two different ways that essentially we could get what was proposed in the NPRM um, after all, despite widespread, uh, widespread objection to it. So I can't predict what's gonna happen, but this is something to definitely keep, keep your eye on. 
Okay. Moving more specifically to behavioral genetic research. So hopefully you've been able to see a few things already that can pop up with some of this work. But in addition to that, what else do we have to worry about? Well, there's sort of two broad buckets. Um, one is misunderstanding the research, whether it's poorly communicated or it's just very comp complex and bad things can happen when it gets misunderstood. The other is sort of misapplications. Um, Gattaca came up earlier tonight, so, you know, I could just cross out misapplications and just put Gattaca on that second bucket, probably. All right, um, you know, I could do a whole lecture just on, on the history of this. Here's just one notable example. So um, Buck v. Bell was an unsuccessful Supreme Court challenge to a Virginia state sterilization statute. Basically, every state had them. Um, Virginia's was not repealed until 1974. So these were on the books for quite some time and were really only relatively recently finally repealed. And this was part of, you know, the eugenics of the 20s, really, that got started in the 20s. And it was based on shoddy science, pseudoscience, really. Um, in this particular case, there were three members of this family and, you know, the, the, the grandmother, if you will, uh, had been a prostitute. Um, she was a prostitute because that was the only way she could survive. Her daughter, who was the plaintiff, Carrie Buck, um, and, and then the mother ended up getting sent to Lynchburg Colony, which was kind of a catch-all for sort of social undesirables. So she was off she went to, to Lynchburg Colony. And then her daughter, you know, ended up being raised by, you know, cousins or something like that. Um, and in short order, as, as a sort of a teenager, she ends up getting shipped there. And it turns out she had become pregnant and that was out of wedlock and that was sort of a no-no. And the real story is that she had been raped actually um, by her, by the, the child of the parents who were sort of fostering her. Um, but that was not something that was going to be allowed to, to be known. And so she was sent off to this colony as well. Um, the daughter, she did have the baby, the daughter went to school and this became a test case and it went all the way to the Supreme Court and Oliver Wendell Holmes famously, infamously said three generations of imbeciles are enough. And he likened us, he made this a public health argument. He likened it to the war and he likened it to vaccination. He said, look, if we can, you know, conscript men to, to war and, and Oliver Wendell Holmes was himself um, a, a war survivor, a vet. Uh, he said, look, if, you know, if we can send people off and I've seen my buddies get killed, if we can send them off for the good of their country to die, and if people can be vaccinated for the good of the public health, you know, we can tie the fallopian tubes. Um, moreover, it's good for you because then if we tie your fallopian tubes, then you can go back into society and be free. You're no longer a harm to the rest of us. Um, and this, this was truly a sort of, um, just as someone who is contagious is harmful to public health, you know, your genes are, are harmful to public health. And it, it's all, you know, it was all bad. Um, her, her lawyer had conspired with the other side um, to basically throw the case. I mean, she didn't even have a proper, a proper hearing. And there's actually no evidence that any of them were feeble-minded, was a catch-all, non-scientific, catch-all, hand-waving, uh, phrase that really referred to, you know, promiscuous women and, you know, bit white trash, if you will, uh, just anyone that, that wasn't sort of welcomed in society was sort of feeble minded. Um, they all had average or slightly better average grades in public school. There was nothing to suggest that, that they were, you know, cognitively impaired in, in any way, shape or form. Okay. Uh, and by the way, it's never been, technically it's never been overturned, Buck v. Bell. Okay. So, so one reason is just, you know, there's an awfully ugly past to a lot of this. And there's a, there's a long history of kind of quickly grasping at biological explanations for things, um, you know, that, that aren't really good explanation for things and that end up doing an awful lot of harm. Um, so relatedly, you know, even if we're talking about actual science as opposed to pseudoscience, you know, some people say, science just has biological explanations for things are, are for whatever reason a lot more compelling than environmental explanations. Um, 
you know, we tend to think of, of biology as, as immutable, as certain or destiny as opposed to probabilistic, uh, as causative rather than correlative. None of those things are true by and large, but um, there are these beliefs. And so engaging in this kind of research, so some say, is, is dangerous for that reason. And it's not just genetics. It's also, you know, there's a whole field of neuroethics. There's genetics, you know, genetics and, and neuroethics uh, in part because Again, um, brain porn, or I'm trying to think, um, you know, you, you show someone a pretty picture, and and some studies have concluded that this this makes um, it makes a case that is otherwise identical more compelling when rationally it shouldn't. All you've done is add a pretty picture of a brain. Okay, why on earth am I showing you a picture of Sheryl Sandberg? Um, a lot of times, people react to some of this research. And, and the criticism is that it's, it, it engages in neoliberalism. What does neoliberalism mean? Um, if you learn, I hope you'll let me know. I'm not 100% sure what it is myself, I confess. Um, but here's one strand. It, it, it means um, focusing on individual contributions to an outcome at the expense of uh, more systematic contributions. So. Sheryl Sandberg, as most of you I trust know, wrote this, this relatively well-known book, Lean In. And it was sort of like, you know, come on, ladies, let's, let's lean in at work, you know, go for what you're, um, you know, there's all this data that show, um, you know, women don't ask for promotions, they don't ask for raises, men, men are totally happy with negotiating, women, for whatever reason, social construction, whatever, they're more shy about it. She's like, come on, lean in and, and start closing the gap you know, by leaning in. And a lot of people said, you know, you're, this is victim blaming, essentially, um, that there are lots of structural reasons why women are not paid the same as men, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and, and by doing this, this is, this is blaming the victim. So this is a little bit of, a, of an analogy, but this is the kind of argument that does come up with some of this work. To the extent that we, we are focusing on biological explanations, some people fear that it must necessarily be at the expense of environmental explanations. Um, as you can probably imagine, I don't think that that has to be the case at all. I don't think that that's true, um, but certainly that is a concern that some people have. Yes, we. Okay, my big catch-all Gattaca misapplication slide is this great, um, this great thing. And, you know, I mean, what can I say, <laughs> you know? So there are all kinds of, uh, of concerns that the more we learn about behaviors, so health is one thing. Um, it's not completely without controversy. Uh, for example, there's lots of controversy about, you know, should we be screening for things like autism and um, Down syndrome? So many people are delightful and they live full lives. And why should we be inviting abortions? And so it's not uncontroversial when you focus on medical, um, medical traits, but it's much, it's like that on steroids when you start talking about behaviors. And so, you know, whether it's, it's attractiveness, IQ, um, athletic ability, whatever it is, when you start thinking about behavioral traits and genes, you know, uh, genetic predispositions to those, people worry about what that's going to mean for reproduction. Are we going to start selecting for that? Uh, and the worries there are come from, a, you know, in, in, a, in a variety of flavors. One is sort of a social justice flavor. So to the extent that these technologies inevitably would be rolled out uh, at, at a very pricey level, at least at first, available to only the haves and not the have nots, could this exacerbate what is already a problematic gap between the haves and have nots? That's, that's one flavor of concern. Um, another flavor is, is sort of a playing God. Are we permanently changing the human race in ways that we can't see, um, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so given all of that, why on earth should, why are we here? Why should we think about engaging in any of this? It just seems really fraught. Well, because despite the dangers, there are also potential benefits. Um, among, among the most, you know, perhaps ironic is actually demonstrating the limits of biological influence. So Nature had a really interesting and somewhat surprising uh, editorial not long ago, I guess um, the end of May, 
about research into genes and IQ, and you can look at the site and read it yourself, but you know, one of the points was that, you know, the more that we study this in the current century, the more we realize that this sort of simplistic, you know, three generations of imbeciles is, is all just grossly, you know, simplistic and, and not scientifically based. Um, these are complex traits that are highly, highly polygenic. They interact with each other and with the environment in extremely complicated ways. Um, so one benefit, arguably, of conducting this research, conducting it well and conducting it, you know, today, uh, is that we start kind of scientifically disputing some of the truly crass um, paradigms of, of old. Controlling genetic variation uh, allows us to better evaluate environmental intervention. So this is a very common reaction. If you're studying uh, you know, genetics and a social science trait, it must be because you, know, you think that genetics is the primary influencer or the only influencer and or that that could only be the only way to intervene and to change things would be you know, a genetic-based intervention. Go back to the genetic engineering Gattaca slide. But that's not the case at all. Uh, it might just be controlling for genetic contribution to an outcome helps us better evaluate environmental um, interventions. Increased knowledge of biological pathways. And one of you mentioned, uh, I won't make you identify yourself unless you want to, but one of you asked me in the sort of email thing, um, you know, given that most genetic data comes from people of European ancestry to date, does everybody really benefit from genetic research? And that's very true. Um, now the question then went on to say, you know, the, the simple answer is we should just sequence more non-European people, and that seems easy, um, but the real problem is what about sort of subpopulations like Mongolians and, you know, are they too small to do anything, you know, to have anything be sort of representative, whatever. I'm mostly going to punt because that's, that's an empirical question and it's not my area of expertise. Um, it might be that Southeast Asian, you know, like a polygenic score based on that data, that's based on much more data would be better than just trying to base it on, you know, Mongolian data, which is presumably smaller n. Um, again, that's not really my thing. But I kind of want to go back to the assumption that, you know, the obvious thing to do is, well, let's just sequence a bunch of, you know, people of African ancestry and people of Asian ancestry, etc. That, unfortunately, is not that easy. In particular, um, in particular, African Americans have, for some, you know, for reasons that I've sort of alluded to, but that, you know, hopefully you've had some um, some exposure to uh, prior to today, uh, Tuskegee, if Tuskegee doesn't ring a bell, just Google that. Um, there's quite a bit of suspicion of both medicine and research among certain communities, and it's not that easy to just enroll them in research. Um, now, the Obama's Precision Medicine Initiative, which has been recently rebranded as the All of Us uh, Research Program, is deliberately, they're trying to enroll one million Americans and they're deliberately seeking to oversample uh, members of underrepresented in research. Uh, they have some acronym that I'm not, that I'm, that I'm messing up, but groups who are underrepresented in research, um, including but not limited to uh, many racial and ethnic minorities. And we'll see how that goes, including Native Americans, including Hispanics, including African Americans. So we'll, we'll see how that goes. Um, but frankly, that has been a challenge. And there have been times where I have, in fact, made that argument and said, you know, we are leaving populations behind by not having them participate in the science because there are going to be benefits and they aren't going to be applicable necessarily to everybody. We're leaving them behind and that's a problem. Um, and we should find a way to, you know, overcome that and, and enroll them. And some people have said, you know, but isn't that paternalistic? Um, so, you know, we'll, we'll see. So those are some of the potential benefits of doing the work. There's also the costs of people who are doing the work with good intentions and, and rigorous scientific tools 
sort of sitting on the sidelines for whatever reason and not doing it. Because not only will you forgo all the benefits that I just talked about, you're going to be ceding this territory to less scrupulous researchers. And they do exist. I mean, someone is going to be doing this work. A thousand percent, there is zero chance that no one is, is going to do this work. Someone's going to do it. The question is who? Um, and I hate to be like a ruthlessly pragmatic ethicist, but you know, guilty as charged, I guess, I would rather see people who um, take these concerns seriously and who are doing really good, responsible science do it than, than ceding the territory. I'm gonna skip that. I'm gonna skip that too. Um, here's a couple of, and if you don't believe me, believe these fancy people slides. Um, so, you know, the Hastings Center Report is a very well-known um, bioethics think tank and journal, uh, and they had a whole big workshop a couple years ago uh, that uh, all, about, um, all about the genetics of intelligence and that particular slice of research. And they concluded, you know, that although they heard profound concern that research would further disadvantage people who are already disadvantaged, no one was arguing that it should come to a halt. This is the Nuffield Council on Bioethics, which is a very prestigious um, body in the UK. They, a little bit earlier, gosh, I think this is 2011, um, they basically reached the same conclusion. They said, you know, this kind of research has the potential to advance our understanding of human behavior, and the research can therefore be justified. However, um, you know, there's an obligation to fund research of a high caliber, to be transparent about funding practices. This is obviously geared towards funders. Um, and everyone should be aware of the potential for abuse and misinterpretation of results. Um, we want to pay very careful attention to public concerns. Okay, so on that note, how is it that we can conduct responsible behavioral genetic research? Well, the first thing is, you know, we've got to kind of get over this, um, this culture where scientists are like, nope, I'm just in the science lane. Um, I'm not thinking, you know, I'm doing basic science. I'm not thinking about policy. I'm not thinking about downstream ramifications. This is all I'm doing. I get that, I really do, but it's just not gonna work in this context. It just, it really isn't. Um, so here, here are some things that, um, that I would suggest where you're gonna have to be proactive and, and kind of go out of your comfort zone a little bit. So one thing is to ask within limits, a lot of limits, about why, why do a particular research project in this area. Now I say limits because you know a lot of important research comes about through serendipity. Um, not all research is hypothesis driven, so I'm, I'm very cautious about demands to say, well, you know, unless you can tell me ex ante at time zero exactly what good this research is going to do, then you shouldn't do it, because that's really not the way science works. That said, it's not a bad idea to try to think, you know, um, it, the, I think the attitude shouldn't be, well, who knows what happens? You know, we're just having fun. And meantime, yeah, but look at all of these groups that you could be upsetting and your fellow scientists. I mean, honestly, this is a very fragile ecosystem. Well, if I could say nothing else, this is very, very fragile. Um, a couple of people, look, look at those three cases. I'm telling you, we've had a common role since 1991 and it hasn't been you know, revisited since 1991. And those three cases, man, they got people to say, let's radically revise the common role on the basis of those cases. So you have an obligation, including to your, your colleagues, to kind of not screw this up. Um, so try to think a little bit about what the end game might be. Study design. Um, you know, the risks are only going to be justified if your study is designed to yield data that's actually sound, right? So it's got to be valid. Um, you know, it's got to be properly powered, et cetera. And I know you're, you're going to be like talking about all of that during, during this camp. Data sharing um, arguably is already an ethical obligation. That's a different talk. So I'll just assert that rather than arguing for it. Um, but it's especially important here. If you're making controversial claims, you've got to be transparent. You've got to be willing to stand behind that and say, here's my data. 
you know, let's talk about it. If you, if you come up with a different result using my data, or if here are my methods and you try to reproduce it and you can't, let's talk, let's figure it out. Um, that's replication. Science communication. Um, you have to be really careful in how you communicate this in presentations, in publications, in press releases. Lordy, in press releases. Um, this is really not a time when you want to let the press guy go to town hyping your study because he or she are not going to know any of this, right? Um, their job is to make you and your university look great. Um, you want to be really careful about hyping results um, um, in this area. You want to be cautious about what we can conclude from things. So yeah, you know, you almost want to be emphasizing um, limitations. I would say that in the first science paper that I say SGAC. I don't. I don't know if you if you're object to that. I don't know if I'm supposed to be saying SS, SSGAC. What? what? It's inefficient. You're an economist. I don't know why is the non-economist being efficient. SGAC it is. Okay, excellent. So SGAC. Um, I mean, I would say that you know the communication that happened around the first science paper was so tiny effect sizes, poly polygenic. We were so kind of cautious that it quickly turned and people were like, wait, why was this published in science? You know, so I mean, you know, pick your poison. Um, but I think you, in the long run, you honestly want to focus more on emphasizing limitations than, than hyping. You've got to be more active in communicating things. Um, it's not just about, here's what we found. You can't assume that people um, are going to know what you didn't find. So you, you have to be really, I mean, I, you know, I, I asked you to read the most recent FAQs, so I won't elaborate those, but um, I think those are pretty good examples of, of doing this. So it's not just here's what we found, it's here's what you should not think that we're saying, here's what we didn't find, here's what this doesn't mean. Um, you can try to seek out responsible journalists, and you may need to actually correct media errors when they when they happen you can try they don't always make the correction um but you know it's it's really not enough if if you're in this field to kind of just shrug your shoulders um, they will get it wrong try to help them not get it wrong the faqs are a really good example of that so here's the website or some version of the website at some point um, you can see the faqs are pretty prominent Publication data phenotypes FAQs. They, they have a pretty prominent role in the website. Um, here's the most recent one, whole section just on social implications of the study. Um, it's not relegated to the last. It's not just one question. It's a whole section on it. Uh, we take it seriously. And, you know, we've gotten some, um, some kudos for doing that. So this is, uh, this is the same Hastings Center uh, Hastings Center, oh, I'm sorry, no, this is, this is a nature editorial. Scientists would do well to follow the example of SGAC um, and their FAQs. This is the same Hastings Center report I mentioned before. Um, they also mentioned that, again, the sort of misunderstanding is, is one of the, the most frequent um, concerns, and they pointed to SGAC's FAQs as, you know, the best example that they could, that they had discovered so far uh, of trying to um, nip those in the bud. All right, and I will stop there. Questions?